Major funding for the Ring of Truth was provided by Polaroid Corporation. For 50 years, we've been bringing art and science together to change the way people see the world. Polaroid. Additional funding was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Public Broadcasting Stations, National Science Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. Motion is everywhere. It can be in response to the great forces of nature, or to an act of life. Form and substance can change almost beyond recognition. Yet within every event, however turbulent, we can find some simple properties that remain absolutely unchanged at every scale, from the cosmos to the kitchen table. Everyone views sparks as something ephemeral, vanishing. They're almost the symbol of the insubstantial. They rise, glow, and die at once. That is a very indulgent view of the world, which depends upon the fact that we are visual creatures. We can easily catch the sparks, some of the sparks, from a, an ordinary Fourth of July sparkler on a kind of net, simply a sheet of white paper. And the sparks fly and soon disappear. You'll see a few bouncing on the paper. But now let us see if I have collected any. I simply tap and crease the paper slightly, roll it. And indeed, something quite material is there. It doesn't seem very beautiful. But if I ask a lens to aid my eye, an ordinary magnifying lens, I see something quite astonishing. They are glittering, lustrous, round beads. That's what's left in these streaks. The sparks are indeed not gone. They have not disappeared. They have left something quite remarkable. And of what are they made? We have an easy way to tell. Here is a tiny horseshoe magnet. I slide it along. The little beads love it. They nearly all leap to it. The artisans who compose the mixture of the sparkler put iron or steel filings, scrap material, into their mixture. The fuel heated them as molten droplets. They flew through the air, round as can be cooled and disappeared from our sight, but not from the world. It is plainly very dangerous to overindulge the eye, to assume because we no longer see something that it has ceased to exist. The candle flame is bright, and around it we expect really nothing but heat, light, rising air. We see nothing else. But for a long time, curious children have managed to reveal something around the flame, which is by no means visible to us. It takes no more apparatus than a cold spoon. When I place the spoon against the flame, a kind of image of the flame in black soot easily appears. There is matter there. 
which has condensed on that surface. I can do it quite a different way. If I hold a little farther away a cold knife blade and move it past the flame, when it is just above the flame in the right place, a breath of steam will condense Water, too, is coming in and from the flame. The flame does not end where the light ends. The invisible is often as significant as what we see. We usually ignore the air that is stored around us until its presence becomes a matter of life and death. We carefully attend to the gasoline we burn, for we pay for it. Morning. Hello, Oprah? Yeah. But the air the engine takes in for free is every bit as essential. Okay, got it. Okay, all right. Okay, try it again. Got it? Racing the engine increases its hunger for air, as the ribbons show. Okay. One more. No one boasts about the mileage he gets from air, but a roomful goes along with each gallon of gas. The two-pan balance is a veteran monitor of change. Flame and smoke carry away substance from the charred matchsticks. The lightened pan rises. In some changes, weight is gained. The white powder is a drying agent that picks up water from the air to become a little heavier. The sensitive balance did not ignore it. The famous Alka-Seltzer fizz departs invisibly. The bubbles escape. The sample becomes lighter. One modification only. Tighten the cap to keep the bubbles in. Now nothing can escape or enter, and the weight does not change. We are on the track of an unchanging quantity. Ah, I've heard about that. We'll catch it in the Exploratorium, the engaging museum of science in San Francisco. What do you mark it with? Oh, it's water vapor. Oh, that's wonderful. Tom Tompkins, engineer and designer here, has created a box to enclose a wide variety of changes. Well, that's very nice. Ah, there's our box. I'm sure that's it. There it is. That's the first time that I've seen the real thing. Aha. Uh -huh. And there, that's that big switch. Right. This is the mercury switch. This was uh -huh. the one I was telling you about. Are you just turning Sorry. that from the outside? Yeah, yeah, it's, it works uh, from the outside by this magnet. There's no hole through the box. This is the battery. And that's okay. the source of the electrical power. Yeah, this powers everything except two things which are powered by their own internal batteries. This is the timer. When I start it, it then makes one revolution, and it turns these switches on and off, which turn on and off the various things that are in the box. So once we trigger it, we've lost control. No wires yeah. to turn it on or off. Okay, so there's the popcorn popper. And nice sparks, the sign of high current. So then the next thing that goes in, I guess, is the fireworks. So there's the firecrackers in place. We just kind of loop the fuses through this wire, which will get red hot. And then we have the penguins. Ah, the marching penguins.
Okay. Now we need the penguins that go on there. Well, there they go. <laughs> A wild device. Turning a little battery into motion. And the next okay. thing is... Um, how to light candles electrically. Yeah, I've, I've had a... This you is discovered by many failures. I see. Give the penguins a lot of room. Great, so there's my electrically lit candle. And then these are the sparklers. Very good. So here's a sparkler cover. Have you ever looked at those sparks? With through a uh, spectroscope or just? No, just with a magnifying glass, catching them. Oh, no. You know what they are? What? Beads of iron. Okay, Beautiful that's... little spheres. There it goes. I like it. Direct drive. Air coupled. The radio uses its own battery. And yeah. then when I... When I short these together, uh -huh. then we get the radio. So that's all I use. On, it's, it's just like the penguins. That is, it goes down here and it hooks onto this switch here labeled radio. Okay, so this is the mouse trap. This is the main trigger. This is what starts the timer. So, in order to trigger it, we move this magnet aside and drop this metal ball. And the magnet stays on to yeah, keep so it the weight. So it doesn't affect the weight. Now you want to seal the box to close it off. Right, so we don't get any air in or out of it. Yeah. So we've cut a rubber gasket here. Uh -huh. We put on the gasket. Oh, well, that will seal. So yeah, the thing is all self-contained. Everything's powered either by this main battery or by its own battery. And there's no wires connected to it. There's nothing like that. The whole yep. thing is just totally independent and self-contained. Yep. OK, seal her up. Let's put the top on it. We may not have totally perfected the electrically lit candle, but we're working on it real hard. Okay, Tom, let's put them on. Uh, it'll take more. We balance the box on an antique farm scale. Now for the fine weights. Okay, try some of those off. Getting close, anyway. Let me deliberately put some here to see if, how well we're doing. I'm putting two coins. I'd say we balance it to about one quarter. When I figure that out, that's better than a part in a thousand for the whole weight. Okay, we have a good seal, we have a balance. Let's start it up. We wanna move away the stools and I'll turn the master switch. I will trigger by moving magnet A so that ball B can fall upon mousetrap C, I hope. But for the rest, you must watch for yourself. Aha, a glow, motion, a candle, pop, sparklers. Oh, that's beautiful. The wind coupled fan. Popcorn. The barrage begins. Plenty of change. Firecrackers. And still it glows. The cube of smoke is good evidence that this box is pretty tightly sealed. 
the balance is well retained. All the changes we saw, from the steam expanded popcorn, to this charging storage battery, to the fan that drives the pinwheel, to the motions of the little toys and the expansion of the springs, to the explosion of the firecrackers and the glow of the sparkler, all those chemical reactions, nothing changed in the balance. Weight, that which we measure on the balance, remains constant during many changes. That's what we've shown here in a rowdy version of an elegant experiment that's been done repeatedly with great care ever since the 18th century and remains a pillar of science today. Uh, this is our Sartorius Ultra Micro Balance. We weighed our active box to the accuracy of a single 25 cent piece. That was the limit of the balance. But this micro balance can weigh far smaller changes. I want you to write your name and not dot the I. Okay, I'll write my name and you'll weigh my name. You'll weigh me. Oh, I didn't dot the I, I remembered. Okay, okay, right. I open the door. The weight indicated on the um, balance would be the weight of your name, fill, plus the filter. Press motor. And you have to wait for it to stabilize. Okay, it looks like we have a stabilized reading. And Phil, you weigh 97.239 milligrams. Okay, I guess I'm losing weight, but all right. Okay. Good. Now yes. then, how about the dot? I'm zeroing out that weight. Uh -huh. So when it changes from zero, all we'll have is the weight of the dot of the eye all by itself. Right. All right. Okay. Here we go. Now I'll dot the eye. All right. You see Let's if your machine can weigh the dot of an eye. Carefully place it in. Put it in again. So this is the weight of the actual dot. Just the dot itself. Right. This scale had no trouble sensing the weight of a penciled dot. And it looks like the dot of an eye weighs 162 micrograms. Well, it isn't very much, but the dot of an eye is pretty small. At the turn of the century, the chemists tried hard to find weight change during chemical reactions. To the thousandth part of this dot of an eye, they saw no change at all. It is remarkable that an explanation of the constancy of weight during change was, so to speak, waiting in the wings. Suppose it were true that the gunpowder in the air and the chemicals, the storage batteries, and the metal of the springs were made of little modular particles. Let us call them atoms. And suppose that what happened in every change is nothing but a rearrangement of those atoms, complicated and intricate rearrangement down deep. The parts are all there, just as many as before. They're only rearranged and hanging onto each other in different intricate patterns. We can imagine that. In fact, it is called the atomic theory of matter. But it automatically explains the constancy of weight because surely from experience we know that just rearranging the weights on the pan of a balance will never change the balance. Now that's far from proving atoms. No, no, we could not claim that was a proof. But it must throw cheer into the hearts of those who believe in an atomic theory before it has yet been demonstrated in detail. But theory or no, the important part is that there is a material balance. Substance must remain in some form. Just because you ignore it and wish to throw it away, it doesn't mean that it disappears. It must go somewhere, just as it must come from somewhere. It is always the same amount. Here we have three little worlds of complex living things, tightly sealed, separated forever from any material input by the fused glass which encloses them. Their fate, whatever it will be, is fixed within this wall of glass. We know 
that the account is strict. Nothing will come out, nothing will go in that is a substance. Of course, they depend upon sunlight, upon day and night alternation, and upon the ambient warmth of our own atmosphere. But is our life so different? We live in a planet Earth which has no glass wall sealing it high above, but gravity holds the air in. It too has an inventory that is almost entirely fixed, and a weight, we have not measured it, but we believe, a weight which remains constant, and all that happens to determine our fate is the rearrangement, the constant ebb and flow of the materials that pass from creature to creature, from place to place, from form to form. This is the Tour de France. The grandest feat of endurance in the world. The event transfixes the national attention as television brings it close every evening. Here in the tightly bunched pack are 200 racers in 20 teams. For its 73rd year, the Tour de France covers 2,000 miles in 23 days, a road circuit of the whole country. A normal day, six hours of racing non-stop. Even injuries are treated at racing speeds. Lunch is taken on the road. Crossing the flatlands on a July day, a speeding racer will drink four gallons of water. Ahead lie the mountains. Heights challenge the racers twice. First the Pyrenees, then the Alps. <laughs> Up they toil over the passes. A total of 10,000 feet in one day. On the way down, they shoot the hairpin turns at 60 miles an hour. The winner in overall speed gains a princely prize. Most of the professionals finish the three weeks only an hour or two behind the winner. We met the 1986 tour at about the halfway point. There they come. 14 days every day racing, and still they're making about 20 miles an hour. Millions of people are excited about this wonderful race. They want to know who wins, and maybe who is second and third. I'm not interested much in the winners. 
I know nothing about winning such a race. Seventy years of experience, intelligence, passion have gone into that. But for me, they're all winners. The first hundred riders who finish the race are within 95% of the speed of the top winner. That's what's extraordinary. It's a remarkable physical performance. I can measure it in one simple way for you. Each day, each racer puts out two or three times the work of a successful marathon runner. And he does it the next day, and the next day, and the next. That's remarkable. And I think we can throw some light upon that by the curiously impersonal, but very deep, methods of science. And that's why I've come here. If we put the entire Tour de France in a box, along with their food, water, and air, we could show the constancy of weight. But we intend to do something different. We have come here to pursue a quite different constancy. A second great account that never fails. This time, we will not verify it. We will assume that it holds and apply it to the complex changes of the Tour de France. We can see some order in the Tour de France if we invoke what I think is the deepest insight of 19th century science. Everybody knows of it. It was the identification of the idea of energy. Energy is not visible. It is an intangible, abstract measure of many forms. Every change, motion, light, sound, magnetism, chemical change, the burning of fuel, the ingestion of foodstuffs, all of those changes represent the transformations of energy from one form to another. But once you learn to take account of its flows, you find that it never disappears and never appears. It can enter or leave, but it must always be accountable. Given that assumption, let us try to look at the Tour de France to see what happens from the point of view of a system which takes in energy and must therefore either hold it or give it out. Nothing can be lost. How much fuel do the racers use? One day at the starting line, we asked them about breakfast. I have a hostess twinkie before I get up. Start off in the morning with it, like a continental breakfast. Oats and rye and all those sort of natural, natural things. Like café, petit pain, confiture. Spaghetti. Rice, chicken, muesli, ambrosias and crackers, a couple of croissants, good fat content. Have a bit of coffee, get the heart going, you know. We get here, I have a have a peach or something. We got them, uh, they give them out at the, uh, at the start. So dig into that before the start. A little bit more coffee, then I'm ready. Their midday meal will be on the wall, passed to them in music bags, one or two for each man. What's inside? Sandwiches, get some fruit, little tarts. The quiche, the tartelette, with um, nuts and raisins mixed together. On a warm day, each racer drinks about four gallons of water. Got to drink lots of water after the race, uh, fruit, stuff that's easy on your stomach. Wait a couple hours and we have dinner. You can use up an awful lot of calories, so you have to put them back in. Every night, the chefs along the route prepare the day's input for the cyclists of the tour. <laughs> These men have a diet different from yours or mine. But how different? 
Chef Jean and I lay out the day's food for one hungry tourist. Me. Café au lait. Not a café au lait. Good. Okay. And then a big roll, these nice rolls that we had. Okay. And some jam. Some jam. Very good. And now for lunch was a picnic out in the country. Three pieces? Yeah, two even. For two. Me. Two of that size. So very good. Yeah, that was a pretty good lunch. We're now at dinner. Yes. And sir. that is a lamb chop. Fine. Lamb chop. Yeah. What about you cook them, the potatoes and the vegetables? Yeah, we cook. Let's I cook see. myself. Okay. Uh -huh. That's the vegetable. Yes, and, the, that's, and that's the potato. Yes, I recognize. Very good. Yeah, okay. And so we have breakfast, lunch, lunch, dinner, and I tell you the truth, I had a small bottle of beer as well. Small bottle of beer. Ah, yeah. No wine, just a beer. Here is the fuel for the Tour de France. First of all, look at it. It is familiar, attractive food. We all recognize it. Good French food well prepared. That is not its special property. What is different is its quantity. That's a lot of food, one racer, one day. The three meals and something in between. Here for comparison, that was my menu for one day of the trip. Quite different from that of the racers. These men are professionals. It is not just the tour that gives them this work. They work all year long. They're cycling each year, amounts to going round the world. And they live by this energy income, a sustained income, every day of their working careers. Their income of food is two or three times the size of mine, day after day. Yet these trim athletes do not gain weight. The energy they take in is in close balance with what they give out. Let us measure their energy income and see how it is spent. To measure, one must have a unit. We will use a unit, but a homely, commonplace one, without a Latin name, quite informal, a jelly donut. Our unit of energy will be the amount of energy released by the combustion of a simple jelly donut in air. If we look at the riders of the Tour de France and look at their large energy income, the diet they take each day, we can use the tables of the nutritionists to compute food stuff by food stuff and weight by weight exactly how much they take in each day. And we could adjust our units to match that if we can. So unit by unit, I remove the jelly donut and another, plenty of donuts available. Now I have assembled about a dozen for my diet every day and for yours. That would suffice, it's a pretty good match but not for the racers. Those men with their remarkable physical performance go much beyond, and they have a big input. And to match it, we need donuts in plenty. Mind you, I'm not making a nutritional recommendation. Neither you nor I nor the racers can subsist on jelly donuts any more than the dietician is recommending that you eat calories. No, diet is quite otherwise. But as a simple, homely comparison unit, the donuts work beautifully. This is the, oh, one more. This is the pile that matches the daily input of a Tour de France racer. 30 or 32, as I have here, fine jelly donut units. That's the energy income each day of one of those athletes. Here is the racer's input made vivid. I can feel the heat. I see the flame rising. The smoke and the sparks are drifting upward. We have burned the 32 jelly donut equivalent of the racer's diet. Start with a little kindling. There is a point. This fire is swift. 
and very hot. It'll be over in a few minutes. Within the body of the racer, the consumption of the fuel takes all day by the much more subtle chemical processes of the cells. Does that make a difference? The answer is no. We have known for a hundred years that if you have the same starting point, here the donuts and plenty of fresh air, and the same end point, here surprisingly similar gaseous products of combustion, both for body and for fire, then the energy release is just the same. It does not matter whether that release is swift or slow. So we have here a rough measure of the energy available to the racer, his income for one day. To count up the 32 jelly donuts equal to the racer's diet, we had to use the published tables of the calorie value of foods. But how did the experts get those values? One way is just what we did. They burned small samples of each food, carefully confined all the energy that came out. It was not easy. This is how they do it. Strong steel cylinder and a cavity inside. You place the substance, the food sample in there, close it up tightly, and add oxygen. They can ignite with an electric spark a little rapid reaction, an almost an explosion, and catch it all inside the strong steel vessel. And the heat slowly flows out into a large pot of water. All you need do is measure the temperature rise of the water. And so they can publish quite accurate calorie values for all the foods you buy. By the way, one jelly donut is just about 250 standard calories. So we have good evidence for the rider's energy input. It is about 32 JD units per day. Now we must pursue the question, how does he spend it? Where does the energy output go in a day of racing? First look at the mechanism, the bicycle. Every cycle is scrubbed clean each evening. No road grit to add friction. They tend the gears, the chain, the pedals. Those hard tires flex steadily as they roll down the road. But the cost of the bending, the friction, the noise can be measured. It amounts to very little. Maybe one or two of our jelly donut units. At racing speeds, that is very little of the energy spent in motion. The history of cycling makes this clear. Here is the graph of one international speed record from 1930 on. In spite of improvements in mechanism and in training, the sprint record changed only slightly until 1975. Change was streamlining an enclosure around the cyclist. The limitation on his speed had been the air he must push aside. As soon as these two matched racers begin to coast, watch the streamliner draw quickly ahead. But those new streamlined bikes are not permitted in the tour. Here each racer must push aside with his body a ton of air every couple of minutes. That is their major task in motion. Yet that costs them only half a dozen or so of our jelly donut units. 
the daily food input supplies us 30 or 32 jelly donut units. All the work the rider does in pushing aside the air and the little losses in the bicycle amount to eight or ten. The account does not work. There's a discrepancy of more than 20 units. But never have we seen the energy account fail, and it surely does not fail in the Tour de France. We are missing something. It is probably invisible, or we would see it. It is probably unintentional, or we would have thought about it. Let us balance the account. Another cycling feat can help us find the missing donuts. Those extraordinary cyclists who fly. Lois McCallan is pilot and human engine for this test plane at an airport near Boston. The objective is to go down the left the runway if you feel it's marginal. This is an early trial of the Daedalus project, the aircraft designed and built at MIT. Okay, all right, helmet. Lois hopes to fly at 70 miles across the open sea from the island of Crete to the Greek mainland. Okay. Ready, Mark? Give me a good push. The plane was designed to make that trip with four or five hours of hard cycling, like a tough day at the Tour de France. Oh, very nice. Road racers are wide open to all the cooling wind their swift motion makes, but the flying cyclist is enclosed in a plastic housing. At the Yale School of Medicine, they test the endurance of the engine. Pushing these pedals matches the effort of flying. The enclosure is a mock-up of the airplane cockpit. The little tube is part of a thermometer that measures core body temperature as she works. And your temperature now seems to be running just below 39 degrees, which is just right for this load. And what we're trying to look for is if you start to become dehydrated, then we expect that your temperature will start creeping up toward 40. The last time that I went through this test, toward the end of the test, I began to have to work harder. I felt as though the load were greater. I had to really work to keep up a constant pedal rate, a constant RPM, to keep that power output constant. And I just knew that I was overheating. I could feel the heat on my face and I was dripping with sweat. I began to feel a little bit faint and, and eventually a little bit chilled. I was overheated. All human work produces waste heat. Could this account for the missing donuts? Look once more at what the racers take in. Four gallons of water. That's more than 60 glassfuls. Why? Okay, Lois, I'm gonna give you some more drink now. First the water Lois takes in is carefully measured, along with the humidity inside the plastic cocoon. How much has the humidity gone up since we started? Over the course of the entire run, it's, let's see, we're talking 80 minutes. Now it's 68%, so we've gone up, what, 23%. 23%. Lois changes the fluid water she drinks into water vapor. That change demands heat. Energy is sent off with the vapor. The tea kettle shows what has happened. Water that boils away gets no hotter. All the heat that flows in from the burner goes to change the liquid 
into the vapor sent out the spout. The cooling essential for a hard-working human engine is right there in the evaporation of water. A small fan makes airflow enough to carry away the water vapor. Going for one hour, uh, rage is started. Yeah. Well, sure, uh, your legs look fairly warm. You're producing some heat. The large muscles in your forearms are fairly warm. But your shoulders look very cool, and you've got a little bit of heat production on your face, and your cheeks particularly. But, uh, but you look pretty cool. The infrared video camera presents lowest skin temperatures as colors. Hotter areas are red and yellow. Cooler ones, green and blue. We're going to turn off the fan, and that, that'll cut off the airflow uh, over your upper body. And then we want to take a look at what, uh, what happens when we shut that airflow off. We want to see where the heat gets produced in your, okay. in your face and upper shoulders. Say when it's too. Okay, why don't we go ahead and turn it off now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Willis. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting a little warm in here. With the fan off, Lois's skin temperature rises quickly. That is a big difference. Yeah. It's now, see, sweltering in here now before it was cool. Yeah, now your it's face really has gotten very warm. And you can see that your neck and your arms are starting to get... I can feel it. I can feel sweat dripping on my face, which I could not feel before. No, yeah. it's, it's, real, okay. it's real clear. With no airstream at all, Lois can evaporate very little water. She would overheat dangerously within minutes. Okay, here you go, Lois. You'll feel the difference. It's been exactly two minutes. <laughs> Makes a difference. Oh, yeah. That's wonderful. Good. That's, that's great. No energetic human performance at all without dominant loss to heat. Skillful, hardworking pilot will need to be supplied with enough cooling air through a vent in the cockpit. And then I'd find myself cranking real hard again. I'm not enough resistance. Well, let's get you out. All engines that burn fuel and oxygen produce a good deal of heat as output. We know that well. The human engine is not a bad example is in fact quite efficient. Very few engineering products work as well as human engine. Even so, most of the fuel is spent as heat. Now we have found the missing part of the energy account. The racers of the tour spend most of what they consume, neither in moving aside the air, nor in the mechanism of the bike, but in making heat, mostly carried off by the evaporation of water. 20 or 25 of the donut units go off as heat. The racers work hard to push aside the air, but that fast streaming wind is exactly what keeps them cool enough to endure. The lesson overall is also important. When the energy account does not quite balance, it is better to look for a missing channel into which the energy is flowing than to imagine you discover an exception to the universal rule to which all experience has led us. The energy account will balance when you strike it properly in every example of change you will pick out. Let us go back and look again at that crazy sealed box we weighed not so long ago. 
the weight of the box stayed constant in spite of all the changes going on because the box was well sealed and no substance, no material could leak out. But is it quite fair to say that nothing leaked out? Sound certainly leaked out. Listen to it. Light certainly leaked out. We see it. The radio kept working, so it must have received something through the walls. I could feel the heat leaking out, too. Are those all nothings? Certainly not. They are forms of energy, themselves accountable under the 19th century discovery. But since they're not substance, they're not material, there's no chemical element in them at all, why, they have no weight. And so it's no wonder that in spite of the leak, the weight balanced. So the chemists and physicists all thought until about the year 1900. They even checked up on it. Mixing chemicals to release a lot of heat on a very sensitive balance, it all worked fine. The balance was retained. Who could ask for more? Young Albert Einstein could and did ask for more. He proposed that energy and mass were really the same and could be converted one to the other. He expressed it in that formula we have all heard. E equals mc squared. That's a formula everybody recognizes. If not, perhaps so many know what it means. What it means is wonderful and even easier than the original expression. Energy in every form has mass. Mass is only the physicist's word for anything that has the property of weight. And energy and mass correspond and are equal. We can and we should write the expression in a simpler form. E, energy, equals M, mass. That's what it says. And therefore, every change in energy requires, means, an equal change in mass, loss or gain. The two go together. Let me show a playful example. I have a little wind-up toy. When I wind it, a spring now relaxed within becomes tautened and distorted with the force and motion of my fingers. That is how I add energy so the toy can go through its tricks. But that energy means that the spring has actually gotten heavier. It has gained in mass as I wound it, as of course I have lost a little mass by the act of winding. And now I let the toy go through its paces, I hope, And as it does so, the spring is unwinding, relaxing, less distorted, and losing energy, and therefore growing lighter, actually losing mass. But how much is that change of weight? The rules that Einstein laid down enable us to estimate how much mass was taken up by the spring and it amounts, roughly, to less than one part in a billion of the weight of the pencil dot over the I in my name. When we saw the energy leaking out of the transparent box as heat and light and so on, we have to accept that mass leaked out as well. And so its weight changed, its weight decreased and yet we didn't see it decrease. There's only one way out of that trap. Yes, the weight leaks out just as Einstein said, but it is so small in amount that we can't detect it on even the most sensitive balances. But does that mean that Einstein's famous formula has never been directly tested? Not at all. There has been plenty of verification. 
but only within the atomic and subatomic laboratories. For they have methods of measuring mass without the use of gravity. Subatomic collisions show the presence of clouds of new particles, new masses, made from the energy of sheer motion. And it is easy to find cases where visible, massive particles disappear into jets of radiant energy. E equals M holds firmly in every change we have seen. Throughout them all, the joint account of energy and mass remains in good balance to the accuracy of our best experiments. Energy is conserved and mass is conserved. The two remain useful even as they merge into one. Call it energy, call it mass as you will. It acts as one quantity, constant and unchanging, throughout every change we have ever seen. The fast and the slow, the large and the small, the profound and the superficial. Major funding for the Ring of Truth was provided by Polaroid Corporation. For 50 years, we've been bringing art and science together to change the way people see the world. Polaroid. Additional funding was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Public Broadcasting Stations, National Science Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. The Ring of Truth book can be ordered direct by calling 1-800-441-3000. Have your credit card ready. Video cassettes for schools, colleges, and individuals can be purchased by calling 1-800-424-7963. The book, 1-800-441-3000. Cassettes, 1-800-424-7963.